Magnus Carlsen does it again, starts a new year off by winning a tournament despite the scraggly looking facial hair. World number three in the live rankings, Fabiana Caruana takes on Robert Hess in the first ever material odds death match. Who's going to win Gibraltar? MVL, Hari Krishna, either way, Peter Dockers and Mike Klein have all the news coverage. And of course, we have the best and worst moments from the month of January. It's everyone's favorite episode. Get ready. It's Chess Center. It's happening now. Well, Sean, the last man standing as far as board games are concerned has finally gone down swinging. The game of Go, very popular in Asia, and we actually had an interview with a Go sort of expert back in Chess Center Episode 9. Viewers can go back and check out. Well, it's gone down swinging to deep mind. Sean, with it, with Go going down, do humans stand a chance at all in any game against artificial intelligence? Uh, yes, I think we should switch to war. <laughs> you mean all-out war? It's time to go John Connor on this? No, the, the card game. Ah, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> we, we should win at least 50% of those. But let's not call the curtain closed on Go just yet. While DeepMind was able to beat Fan Hui, it still has yet to beat Lee Sedol, the world Go champion. So we still have, have one last hope in that arena. It's a good point. In fact, that match is already being planned with a $1 million purse on the line. Now, I, I also, thinking about your comment about war, I guess if we ever did get into all-out war with the machines, maybe just best to offer them a game of tic-tac-toe like Matthew Broderick did. <laughs> or put them against a three-year-old with a glass of water. That's, that's also a good point. We look forward to the results of the World Go Champion versus a computer, and uh, we can't wait to see if, if mankind can hold on for a little bit longer. Well, Robert, former world champion and one of the best players of all time as far as I'm concerned, he helped us debut the upset of the week last week by giving up a draw in round one at the Tradewise Gibraltar Chess Festival. And unfortunately, he's helping us to keep it going, struggling mightily right now. Having lost two games to much lower rated players, Robert, he's lost more than 20 rating points, fallen out of the top 10 in the live rankings, probably probably since you were born with that baby face of yours. But I'm not going to uh, dish out too much pain toward Vichy. I know he's already struggling. Instead, I'm going to let you take the wheel and tell everybody why it was such a huge mistake here for him to play King H4 to defend the pawn instead of Queen takes F7. Go ahead and take us through these lines here. Absolutely. Queen takes F7 is a check, so it forces the king back to C8. You're going to play Queen G8 check, forcing the king out to B7 to avoid all further white checks, and knight f6. It protects the pawn on h5, protects the queen on g8 in case there are any problems, and more importantly, it also provides an, an extra pass pawn. The f pawn now is free to roam down the board. Instead, back in the initial position, Vichy went king to h4 to protect the h pawn, but his opponent went queen h2 check, forcing the king onto the g file. The queen followed the king to the g file. King went to h6, and now after queen takes g8, White recoups the, the queen with knight f6 check, king e7, knight takes g8 check, and now king f8. And the real problem is that White cannot stop that past a pawn, and with that, Vichy was forced to resign in just a couple moves. Yeah, it's really strange. It's almost like he went for the whole combination, forgetting that Black had this past a pawn, right? Uh, either that or, or a serious miscalculation, panicking about some sort of phantom mating net. Unfortunately, though, for Vichy, it, it didn't stop there. As we move on to our, our next game, he took on the young Hungarian Benjamin Gladura, a really talented kid who's played in multiple events on chess.com, actually. And uh, the young Hungarian gave Vichy a little bit of a king and pawn ending here. He played knight to c5, and, and Vichy, for whatever reason, decided he could hold the end game. The truth is, the only way to play this position, right, Robert, is to keep the bishop on the board and move the king. N not to say that white isn't pushing, but... Uh, after the trade and, and White clearly showing the king dominance with h4, Black is already basically in a lost king upon ending in Zugzwang. Take us through the next few moves and explain to everybody why this, this king power is just so critical here and why Vichy really just went into a lost king upon ending. Yeah, earlier in the game it was even easier. It was a double minor piece ending. It seemed like a very simple draw, but you know, unfortunately for Vichy, he went astray. And here the big problem is that the White king is far more advanced and black, it's not clear what to do. If you go b6 check, for example, the problem now is the king goes to d5 and runs over to the king's side to attack that pawn that's a little bit too far advanced on h5. So instead of allowing white to run to the king's side first, Vichy tried to keep the king on the queen side, but it, unfortunately for him, he ended up in the Zugzwang position. After king b6, king c8, 
His opponent said when B4, the young Gluduro just knew what he was doing. He simply pushed his pawns, and there was nothing black could do. As we see here, the pawn just kept pushing up the board. White is going to create an outside pawn with the pawn H5, and also stops black's movement on the king side. And here, as we see in the final position with the king on A8, there's nothing black can do but resign. If king to B6, simply king to B8, and you pick up the B pawn, and the white's B pawn rolls first. Yeah, the, uh, the the tricky part is maybe Vichy had calculated some way that he'd be able to actually keep this king at bay with opposition. As you said, though, it, it wasn't it wasn't meant to be. Couldn't keep that white king out. And uh, noted should be that even the move f6 was was also forced by Black because if if Vichy doesn't try to play f6, which creates more potential ways that king might have been able to get in over here on the king side, uh, White's just going to play g5 and then and then create the past h pawn. So. All kinds of threats, really a, uh, a, a tough loss, of course, for the world champion, who certainly is better than that. But when, when it rains, it pours, I guess, as they say. And right now he is pouring rating points. And because of that, we are rewarding him two weeks in a row with our upset of the week. In featured news this week, we have the same two events as last week. One of them is wrapped up, though. And the two biggest names of this featured news segment are the last two contenders for the world championship. Peter's going to bring you first to the talk of what happened at Top to Steel. Yeah, first, uh, the world champion, the winner of that last title match, um, he won his first super tournament, Wai and um, yeah, he did it in a convincing fashion again without any loss. New Year, same result. Carlson is still dominating, but tell us how he did it. How did he wrap up the tournament? Yeah, well, he was uh, basically finishing uh, with uh, two out of three, and uh, that was uh, more than enough. He, uh, he won on Friday against uh, Hu Yifan, the women's world champion. She was close to a draw, but she uh, she blundered in a in a pawn landing, and uh, we will see that actually in uh, blunder of the week. And uh, yeah, and he finished with a draw against Wesley So and Ding Li Ren. And because Fabiano Caruana lost his uh, final round game, uh, he he got to end uh, clear first. Uh, Magnus Carlsen. If Caruana had won, he would have tied, and he would have had a better tiebreak actually. And now to events closer to home, at least our home for the last couple of weeks, the Tradewise Gibraltar Chess Festival on the Iberian Peninsula. We have a couple rounds left, and since we had our news report last week, a lot has clarified with a few rounds to go. Peter, what's the situation look like? Yeah, well, we had a lot of uh, upsets uh, so far already. Uh, for example, Hikaru Nakamura, he uh, dropped a few half points here and there, uh, but he's still in contention. But uh, yeah, the news is dominated uh, by uh, the other player in the last world title match, Vichy Anand. He's playing a terrible tournament so far, actually. Um, he lost the game uh, yesterday and uh, today in uh, the eighth round he uh, didn't get more than a draw against an international master. He's at the moment losing 24 ELO points in Gibraltar and dropping out of the top 10 in the live ratings. Yeah, first time since the early 90s. Really interesting. But Anand's bigger tournament is coming up in March. The candidates, I'm sure he'd sacrifice a few points here to get his wins in there. We'll see if he's able to recover in about one month's time. Well, that's all for featured news, Danny. We will bring you the conclusion of the Tradewise Gibraltar Chess Festival on next week's Chess Center. Our move of the week comes to us from the Tradewise Gibraltar Chess Festival, where Gopal took on David Howell, two grandmasters locked in intense action. And just when it seemed like Black might be able to hold uh, from being under pressure for quite some time, Gopal found an absolutely nasty move here. Robert, tell everybody what that was and how Mr. Howell was a gentleman letting him play it out to checkmate. It's not every day you get to sacrifice your queen leading directly to checkmate, but here Gopal did so with queen to c1. Now the queen on h6 is overloaded. It has to protect the knight enough eight. Well, now it's under attack. So queen takes c1 was more or less forced. And after rook takes f8 check, king h7, rook takes f7 check. If the king goes up to h6, you deliver the beautiful knight g8 checkmate. Beautiful. So the king can't go up. It's got to go backwards. And once it goes back to h8, knight takes g6 check, king g8, and rook g7, delivering checkmate down a queen just for a knight. It's amazing, especially because uh, David was such a gentleman, right? I mean, it'd be very easy to resign on a move like queen to c1 because, as you pointed out, the queen is overloaded and there's nowhere to go. But David said, well, I'd rather reward the rather brilliant sacrifice and let him checkmate me on the board. So he goes for it. We like to uh, use our English accent, as we rarely get to on Chess Center, and show that beautiful mating net one more time. It's instant replay style, and for that, we give Mr. Gopal the move of the week. Well, Sean, the social networks were abuzz this week when a video was released of Paul Rudd 
taking on Stephen Hawking in a game of quantum chess. It had everything from a Keanu Reeves voiceover to tweets by Will Ferrell and others. We're going to take a quick look into this video for those who haven't seen it yet. We won't ruin the ending. Don't want to tell you who wins. But uh, as I click play right now, battle. Sean, we uh, we take a look as, as Paul Rudd realizes that he he's this is but a actually of the in new it for a tough battle. And he the knows nothing about The full power of quantum right? chess is far greater. <laughs> as our this story. reminds me of when I first started playing chess, and I didn't even have to worry about the quantum angle. Oh, I'm probably gonna. No, lose. <laughs> it's really funny as he as he has the moment of clarity, and then he goes frantically looking for any book on <laughs> chess. He eventually finds Bobby Fischer teaches chess. Of course, that was your first first chess book, right? Um, my first chess book, I actually tried my system and, uh, and then graduated from there. Well, I can say that my first book on quantum physics was definitely Quantum Physics for Babies, which is a book that Paul Rudd gets to checking out. And we encourage all of you viewers to go check out the video. Just Google Quantum Chess Paul Rudd. You'll find it. It's fun. Anytime we have celebrities playing chess, it's good for the game. Right, Sean? Absolutely. All the attention we can get. Now we are excited to be joined once again by Fidia Master Mike Klein from the Tradewise Gibraltar Chess Festival. The long tournament is not over yet. Mike, give us the news that isn't necessarily making headlines, but perhaps headline worthy. There was a lot this week, Danny, a lot of news I wasn't even aware of. My colleague Peter Doggers wrote the sad obituary of Romanian legend Elisabetta Polarinade. She died in her ninth decade of life. She was pretty much a, a renaissance woman in Romanian chess. She was a WGM, seven-time women's Romanian champion. She was the organizer of the Bosna tournament. She's also a TV personality. In fact, the Bosna tournament was slated to possibly come back this year, but her death leaves that a bit in question. Keep in mind, she won the Romanian women's championship seven times. That's the equivalent of what Irina Crush is currently done in the U.S. Women's Championship. So that's the kind of fame that we're dealing with here in the country of Romania. Well, an impressive career, and I'm sure she leaves behind quite the legacy. Of course, it's sad news when you see someone who, not only with that list of accomplishments, but someone who was doing so much currently to grow chess in her own country. Yeah, Anybody, I wish I had met her again. Sorry, go ahead. I wish I had met her. Yeah. Well, anybody who's curious about her life, of course, can check out Peter's full obituary at chess.com slash news now. On a slightly lighter note, I understand we might have a new chess superstar in the Middle East. Right. Someone who's barely in the second decade of his life made news in Iran. Uh, this would be Alareza Faruja. He doesn't even have a FIDE title, but he's 2455, and he won the Iranian championship, which, by the way, had some strong grandmasters in it. He won it by a full point. He's actually the 60th, that's 6 0 ranked player on the top junior list. Doesn't seem so impressive, except that there's not a single person younger than him on the list, born in 2003. So this guy doesn't know anything about uh, many topics that we grew up with. New kids on the block has no idea who that is, Danny. Well, it's exciting and uh, love to see a, a young star rise to the top. Before we let you go, Mike, not getting enough love and featured news was the challengers section from Y and Z. Of course, we know Magnus taking down the top, the top group, but give us a little bit of an update on how the challengers wrapped up. Well, any lack of coverage of the challengers here is, of course, offset next year because the winner of the challengers gets to play in the top masters group. And that's going to be quite a challenge for Baskaran Adiban. He is the winner. Three players finished with nine out of 13. His tie breaks were better, so he gets the automatic slot against the big boys next year. He'll probably be one of the lowest rated, along with Logan Van Uele, assuming he accepts his usual invitation. So it's going to be a big challenge. Now, traditionally, the Tata Chorus Vikanze tournament has invited a player from the challengers group who has also tied for first. It's kind of like an unofficial you know, handshake agreement. But there was two this year, El Taj Safarli and our hero from Chess Center Past, Alexei Dreyev. The old guy was one of the quali one of the people that tied for first, so it'll be interesting to see if an invitation is sent to both of those. That might water down the tournament as far as average rating, but it would be kind of a cool story for some new players to get in the game there. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I can't wait to see how that storyline shapes out, and it's exciting either way to see some some new blood, right? A new a new fish swimming with the sharks next year at Tata Steel. And Mike, we thank you for taking time away from your busy schedule there in Gibraltar to join us, and uh, I will see you in time trouble, buddy. Thanks, Danny. Well, Robert, our blunder of the week comes to us from the Tata Steel chess event, perhaps no game more critical, and helping Magnus Carlsen on his way to winning the 2016 Tata Steel chess tournament. And in this game against Ho Yifan, after a really well-played game by both sides, we thought we were headed for a draw, at least 
pretty much everybody following the game did. But Yifan makes one decision here, which can already be half our blunder of the week. And following that with a truly misplayed king upon ending, as complex as it was, we have to acknowledge this game as a real turning point in helping Magnus win. And I'm going to let you take the wheel here and tell everybody what move she should have played and the move that she did play with the misevaluation of the king upon ending. Yeah, the former women's world champion traded queens on c3. Pawn to d4 would have been a much easier drawing attempt. The queen ending is very, very difficult to make any sort of progress, so her life would have been much simpler had she gone d4. Instead, she decided to go queen takes c3. Of course, king takes c3 is the response. And here is where she made the critical blunder with pawn to h5. Instead, Moving the other rook pawn was a way to salvage the half point. If pawn to a5, the idea is that when white goes b4, you simply ignore it, go king to d8. And even once white captures over an a5, the idea here is actually somewhat simple. When the going king d7 here, the idea is that once the king, the white king goes to d4, the black king always has to be in reach of the e6 square, keeping the king away from e5. When the white king goes to b4, threatening to go pawn to a6 and sacrifice that pawn, the black king needs to be able to approach the c7 or c8 squares to then go to b7 to stop that king from infiltrating on the queen side. So instead of going a5 and holding a complicated draw, she went h5, after which Magnus made quick work of the king of pawn ending. He sure did, uh, immediately exposing the, the critical point of why a5 needed to be played, which was to stop the move that we see Magnus go for, king to b4. He says, well, I'm not going to I'm not gonna have to ask you twice to activate my king a little bit further. And after putting black in Zugzwang, I think Yifan already realized the end must be near. Because with a king on b6 and a king on c8, pretty similar as we saw Gladura take down Anon from the Tradewise Gibraltar Chess Festival, there's really not uh, many chances to hold here when the king is that much better than its counterpart. And after a simple trade, Yifan actually resigned on c3 because as soon as this king moves, what, what, let's say to d7 to hold, hold the threat of c6 a little bit longer, it's only a matter of time before Magnus progresses, trades off the c-pawns, and with it, again, flexes the muscles of his king versus Yifan's king. To back up to the critical point you pointed out, I know this is a little more time than we normally spend on some of these moves or blunders. I just think it's really instructive to point out the complexity of the corresponding square issue here, right, Robert? This this a5 move, as much as we criticize Yifan, maybe the blunder was really trading queens because a5 and anticipating that b4 has to be met with a with a high class waiting move like king to d8 is really not an easy thing to do, right? And, and when corresponding squares are concerned, you have to anticipate everything. If the king touches d4, I gotta be here. If the king touches this, I gotta be here or here. And if white did some sort of waiting thing, black would still have to make a waiting move, letting white choose first. And I, I just wanted to point out that that really is not an easy thing to do. So I agree with you and your analysis from the chess.com report that probably probably her best bet was just to avoid trading queens, right? Is it is it something that you struggle with when you're playing a stronger player to want to simplify to the more forced example of a drawn ending? And maybe that's what Yifan fell for here? Yeah, I think it's relaxing too soon. The idea here was that Black had been playing a great game, as you mentioned, ha held pretty much an equal game that all throughout against the world champion, and at the wrong moment relaxed and traded queens, thinking, you know, this should just be an easy draw. It's a king and pawn ending. No worries. But instead, keeping the queens on the board gave her much greater chances. And then, of course, after the queen trade, seeing A5, which is very, very complicated, um, you know, it it's a missed shot by the former women's world champion. Well, not an easy one to see, still worthy of our Blunder of the Week, perhaps because of the significance of the game itself and because our chance to teach you some King Upon endings. Either way, thank you, Robert, for joining us on Blunder of the Week, and uh, congratulations to Magnus for winning this year's Tata Steel. Sean, it's everyone's favorite time of the month. We get to take a look back and give out our meaningless awards and make fun of people or, or acknowledge them for things they don't even know that we're doing. Are you ready? <laughs> I'm ready. All right, we're going to start on the good side of things with number five for the best. We're going to give this one to Dimitri Draken for giving all of us a thrill, nearly going 9-0 and in January's title Tuesday. And then the only reason he didn't is because Alex Lenderman defended a horribly lost position like a madman genius, and the game ended up being worth the wait that we still haven't seen a perfect 9-0. So he's our number five. And Sean, what do you got for number four? 
Well, for number four, I have Nakamura absolutely destroying the Chess.com staff team, even with five minutes to one minute odds, and even with me attempting to play an illegal move. Uh, that was just very well done by his part. Yeah, uh, props to Akaro. Number three is going to go to Chess.com. We're going to reward and acknowledge ourselves here for launching the announcement of the Grandmaster Blitz Battle Series. We already have guys like Grishuk, Maxime Vache, Legrave, Akaro Nakamura, and if you tune in on Thursday to Chess TV, we may have an announcement of another top 10 GM joining us. Sean, over to you with number two. Yeah, for number two, we, want, we wanted to give it to Magnus Carlsen for winning Tata Steel, but uh, I'm going to have to give number two to myself for calling that Magnus Carlsen would come in number one and that Fabiano Caruana would come in number two, which is exactly what happened. I, I can't blame you. You are getting better at your chess predictions. Number one, even though Magnus did win the biggest event of January, something that will maybe will never happen again happen in January, which was Paul Carey's was minted onto the Euro coin. Uh, an amazing thing for a chess player to have his mug all over something that people are going to use every day. He's also on a stamp. Uh, has any chess player ever been more celebrated? We talked about it last week. We don't think so. So he gets our number one best moment for the month of January. Well, Sean, with every action in the chess world, there is a chess center reaction. What goes up must come down. Are you ready for the worst side of things? I'm ready. Well, that's good, because apparently Vichy Anon was not ready when he signed up for the Tradewise Gibraltar Chess Festival, dropping multiple games to lower-rated players, and because of that, he is taking our number five for the worst of January. I'm going to give number four to the Chess.com team for losing so badly to Nakamura. We are the largest chess site in the world. You think we would have been able to pick up a single game? And really, I want to put the most blame on the person whose responsibility it was to take Nakamura out and get him drunk beforehand. <laughs> I don't really know who that person was, but I'll check the chess.com task list and see who dropped the assignment. Number three, though, is going to go right back to Nakamura for the worst side of things as he was unable to defend us humans against Komodo, the beast, the dragon. He went down two and a half, one and a half, and Komodo, well, he seemed to kind of sleepwalk through it. We're going to give Hikaru and all of humanity number three for finally going down, even in material odds to computers, Sean. Yeah, I'm going to give number two to Mabandyarov. He's lost uh, a, a game where he was ahead, and he gave up a rook and a terrible blunder. This is an early candidate for blunder of the year. Yeah, that game against Eliana from the Tata Steel chess tournament, it was really, really bad. I'm sure we'll see it again. And speaking of really bad and really sad, it's horrible when we lose a great person on this planet, horrible when we lose a great chess player, but even more so when we lose someone so young, so just getting started in their chess career. Ivan Bukovshin died at the age of 20. We wish his friends and family the best, of course, and give Mother Nature or Fate, whatever you want to call it, the number one worst thing that happened to the chess world in January. Well, don't look now, Robert, but on February 4th, you and I are taking on Lawrence Trent and Fabiana Caruana in the first ever double feature Blitz deathmatch. And it's got odds. It's got commentary while playing. I I'm so excited for this. And it has nothing to do with the fact that I'm going to destroy Trent, both on the board and, I mean, I, I don't... I don't want him to cry, so I'll I'll do what I need to do there. But what what are you gonna do to Fabiana Caruana? Come on, let's um let's let them know what's coming on Chess Center. You know, Danny, you can be all the braggadocious you want here. You're you know have a tough match in front of you, but I like your chance against Lawrence. You're gonna trash talk him. You're gonna beat him down. I know that I've worked with Lawrence before, but Fabiano, I mean, he's the ultimate competitor. I'm going to try my best. You know, it sounds cliche, but he's number, what, three in the world right now. Just a great showing in Tata Steel. So I'll try to give him the beat down in the bullet games. But in the Blitz, I'm just going to be hoping to survive. Well, for those who don't know, Robert will get a one-game odd in each time control, which uh, it's not that much, honestly. I mean, he's number three in the world, and you and I are over the hill. I mean, I don't want to, you know, call a, a spade a spade, but... <laughs> This is this is gonna be tough. So, what's it like going up against your childhood uh, your childhood buddy here and, and and seeing him go on to be the uh, the the player that he is today? Are you gonna give him some commentary lessons, regardless of what happens in the match? Well, he may be number three in the world at chess, but I'm n number one in your heart, Danny Wrench. So I'm liking my chances here, especially the you know the trash talking. Uh, you know, we're not gonna be doing commentary during the show, but afterwards I can give him a verbal beatdown if need be. Well, we'll make sure to have you both on the show afterwards and remind everybody, if you have any other plans on February 4th, that's Thursday. It is time to cancel those plans. Look ahead and uh, watch for me and Robert to take on Lawrence and, uh, and uh, Fabulicious this Thursday. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be fun, and I can't wait. 
We're excited to bring him back one last time from the Tradewise Gibraltar Chess Festival. Mike, you don't have much time before it's time to come home and before your clock is ticking. Are you ready for time trouble? Bang the gong, Danny. Let's do it. I'm going to start us off with the first question about a Japanese chess computer, or should I say former Japanese chess computer, now calculating mortgage loans. Mike, do humans do anything for each other anymore? Yeah, they say this computer can mimic human judgment. I could have used it in my 20s. Now, recently, a computer just beat a top human in the game of Go. Is this equivalent to I am David Levy losing a deep thought in 89? You know, it might be just a sign of things to come. At this point, I don't expect humans to compete in board games for much longer in, in anything. But let's cut the guy a break. He didn't just lose to a single deep mind. He lost to all of Google. Now, sure. moving on from Go and back to chess, the heart rate monitor is gaining traction. A lot of people lobbying to see top players use it. Does chess really need all these bells and whistles to sell itself? I think so. Last month at a match in Sweden, Sevian Grandelius began 1B4. The heart rate monitors for both players spiked on the TV screen. That's some data I can get behind. <laughs> now, recently, Kasparov just linked Carlsen and Novak Djokovic, both winning important events on the same day. You buy the analogy? Uh, uh, somewhat. How about Djokovic is actually the Carlsen of tennis instead of the other way around? Now, I understand the Gibraltar evenings off the record events. We have the men versus women giant blitz chess battles. The time odds are in the ladies' favor, but the men are still winning most of the matches. Do we need to do something to shake things up here? Uh, the women were supposed to get time odds ostensibly because they're wearing high heels to the classy event. But you know what? None of them wore heels. So I think they kind of took advantage of the rules there, Danny. Now, lastly, Danny, this one just came across our desk. Millionaire Chess 3 is on, but they're traversing coasts. They're in Atlantic City this year. Will we find you there, Danny? Nothing gets me more excited than the Jersey Boardwalk. <laughs> but no, in all seriousness, we wish Amy and Maurice the best. Excited to see it move to a new location and to continue to try to bring high stakes to chess. Mike, thank you for joining us in Time Trouble. Get back to work, bringing us a great, a great show from Gibraltar, and we'll see you next week.